say that in the old days the rabbis would sit when they gave their sermons or when they gave their pronouncements. And Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount here that our text comes from uh, was sitting down to talk to his disciples and tell them what his message was. Now, it's been said that these passages that we read today in the gospel are the bad news. It's not made, the Ten Commandments have been made even tougher. Thou shalt not kill becomes don't even think about being angry. Thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. Don't even think about it. One of our Jewish friends, woman friends, said to me once uh, when I said, it's about do not commit adultery that I, that I was going to preach. And she says, it means don't even think about it. <laughs> well, how can you help it? You know, we have such uh, a, a, a society in which the women are made so often to look temptatious, to be flirtatious, to act flirtatious, to tempt men into leering at them, thinking about them, thinking thoughts that they would, I don't know, rather not have thought about them, I don't know. But we live in a society where there's lots of that going on. Do not even think about it. Okay, that's hard to do. Uh, and the others that we have here, do not uh, swear, do not give an oath. And it's interesting because in our Old Testament lesson, Moses is swearing by heaven and earth about what he's just telling these people. Swearing to is was considered by Jesus not necessary. You are supposed to be honest and forthright and say the truth. And if you were that way, and everybody believed that, then you wouldn't have to swear by heaven or by the temple or by the hair on your head. Because you can't swear by the hair on your head because you can't turn it white or dark. Well, today you can. <laughs> or purple or green or whatever color you want. But the idea is you can't make your hair change except by artificial means. So don't swear by your head. Don't swear by your hand or by your feet or by the temple or by Jerusalem. And people would swear, make oaths in these names. We make oaths in the name of God. When you go on jury trial uh, you're, or as a witness, you swear with the, on the Bible. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. So don't do that, he says. And I don't know what the, the court would say about that if you didn't do it, but the Quakers don't do it. They wouldn't do it. The Essenes didn't do it in the time of Jesus. They would not swear or take an oath at all. It doesn't mean don't swear by using language that is inappropriate. Don't take the God's name in vain. That's something else. And that's a whole other sermon which I would like to preach to you someday. Because we, and as, as us sailors often do, often swear like a sailor, they say. Like a drunken sailor, <laughs> maybe. So. What is, what is it that Jesus is saying? He is being, he's being radical about the law. It's not just 10 commandments. At the time of Jesus, there were hundreds of commandments. And only the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the lawyers and the priests, knew all of them and tried to keep them and became so self-righteous that Jesus was always calling them whitewashed tombs or putting them down full of dead man's bones outside they look beautiful. The people didn't know what all of those commandments were and they were always breaking them. There were so many, there were so many rules about cleanliness and being uh, holy in front of in front of the in front of the temple. If you wanted to come into the temple, there were lots of things you couldn't do. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans, you know, were the outcasts. They were from the 
northern kingdom, which had split off with over which mountain was where you worship God, years and years before. And so the Samaritans were people that you didn't have anything to do with. Jesus tells a story about a man that gets waylaid on the road by the robbers and he's left almost dead. And along comes the priest. And he sees this man and he's bleeding and all and walks on the other side so he wouldn't be defiled. He didn't want to be able to not go into the temple. Or the, or the, or the scribe that comes by and does the same thing, walks over on the other side and leaves the man bleeding in the, in the trench. And along comes the Samaritan, the outclass, the underclass, the, the one who is outside the, outside the hall, comes and binds him up and puts him on his donkey and takes him to the inn and has the innkeeper take care of him, pays, says, if you need more, I'll pay you when I come back this way. Who was the neighbor to this man, Jesus asked. Who is the neighbor? The problem with all of these rules is they make us further and further away from God because we can't keep them all. We may not even know them all. And even the ones we do know, we cannot always keep. St. Paul, who wrote perhaps 50 years before Matthew wrote this gospel, says that the law was put in was given to us so that we would so that we would be guilty, so that we had no recourse on our own, but only by the grace of God could we be made righteous. That God, we had to depend on God. That was the idea of the law to Paul. We had to depend on God who would make us righteous, who would lift us up. And even though we're sinners, we confess sin every morning in the church. And, and ask for forgiveness and for absolution. And though we are sinners, God forgives us and wants us to be his children, wants us to be part of the family, part of the communion with God. So the law is made so that we will break it and so that we will then depend on God depend on God for God's mercy, for God's grace, for God's forgiveness. I'm tempted to stop here. Don, uh, Jim said uh, a, a short sermon is always welcome, but I have a whole lot more to say. <laughs> in, the, in the first reading, we have uh, Moses telling the people, this is in Deuteronomy. Now, this is a, a, a recap of all the, all of these first books of the, of the Old Testament. A recap of what they had done. And he says, you were now at the border to the promised land. You have to cross the Jordan into the promised land. And I set before you the blessing and the curse. Choose the blessing. Obey God's word. Do what is right. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Well, he didn't say that, but love your neighbor because they have lots of enemies all around them. And they've been fighting the enemies all the way through the desert. And they'll fight some more. But as you keep in touch with God, as you keep God in your sight and make him or her the main part of your existence, of where you go with your life, then you will live. And you will be, and everything will be well for you in the land. But if you don't, if you forsake God, if you forsake your neighbor, if you forsake the commandments, then you will die. You won't die right away, perhaps, but you will die in your relationship with God, with your in your relationship with your fellow people, and you will eventually go into that hot place down there in Gehenna, Gehenna, down in the valley below Jerusalem where all the trash was dumped and the fires burned continually, down into hell. So Moses is saying, choose life, 
Choose the right thing. Choose to do the right thing. And Jesus says, the right thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. The summary of the, all the laws is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your might, and your neighbor as yourself. So love yourself even though you're a sinner. Love God with all your heart, with all your being. And choose, choose rightly what you do. And remember, I'm reminded of uh, one of the, uh, a movie where they're going after the Holy Grail. And they come down into this big cave out in the desert and the old knight is there and he comes to defend the Grail. And they say that they're seekers of the Grail. And there's all of these different chalices and cups on the altar, candles burning all around, some beautiful, big bejeweled cups, some clay pots, some little mugs. Choose carefully. And the bad guy chooses the wrong one and he drinks it and he, and he dissolves right into nothing in, the, in, in front of the camera there. It's wonderful imagery that they have there. The person, Julian Nightmare. Julian Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> And then the other one chooses a clay cup and he drinks it and the knight says, you have chosen wisely. Choose wisely. It may mean your life or death. Choose your words carefully. You Words are who you are. What you say you can't take back. They're out there. Be careful what you say. Choose how you look at things. Choose what you think about each other. Choose what you see. Is it a wonderful, beautiful world? Or is it a world that's crashing and going to hell in a handbasket? You can see it either way. Read too much news. Look at too many uh, TV newscasts. And you might see it as a dark place. But if you read this book that we've been talking about, if you think about God, about Jesus, about love, about each other, then you'll see the world as this beautiful place. Choose life. Choose life that you may live in this beautiful place. We're supposed to tell a joke now because Bob has been recording this and he has to then turn off the TV thing and come back in. So we're waiting for him. She's going to play. We'll play. Oh, good. Yes, thank you.